Thank you very much. We are so appreciative, as I said at the beginning, for your coming out this evening. It's a very special occasion for all of us. We're going to have the chance to hear from President Carter himself to talk to us about his views, what has happened maybe since the film that he can share, uh, was filmed uh, about a year ago, what has happened, prospects for peace from his view. And we also have a very special guest with us this evening. We want to hear from him. He is the bishop from the Lutheran Bishop of the Holy Land from Jerusalem. Uh, the Reverend Bishop Yunnan is the Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, an outspoken advocate of peace with justice in the Holy Land. The Bishop continually challenges Christians to stand up and raise their prophetic voices to be witnesses for justice and nonviolence and ministers of peace and reconciliation in the Holy Land. He is also Vice President of the Lutheran World Federation President of the Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches, Chair of the Augusta Victoria Hospital Board, Chair of Local Reference Group for the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel, and an active member of the Middle East Council of Churches Executive Committee. He is a leader in interfaith dialogue with Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and is the author of the book Witnessing for Peace, and many articles, speeches, and lectures on religion, politics, and peace building in the Middle East. I hope he'll talk to you about a mission he's been on this last week to Washington, D.C. with an interreligious group of the chief rabbis from Israel, the leading Islamic leader, and five, the five principal Christian leaders from the, the city of Jerusalem that were here together to talk about peace. And he says, Why are Christians leaving the Holy Land? What will it take to finally reach a lasting peace in the Middle East? Bishop Munib Yunan of the AELCJHL will share his perspective with us tonight as a Palestinian refugee who now leads the only Palestinian Lutheran church in the Holy Land. He will discuss the future of Palestinian Christianity in the midst of Israeli occupation and prospects for peace with justice in this troubled region. I would like to welcome to the stage President Carter and Bishop Munib Yunan. We'll take questions after each has made some comments. And as I pointed out, if you will pass your questions to the end, I will collect them now. Uh, since the movie was just over, I think I'd, uh, we, we could start with your questions about the film. I hope this has not caused any of you would-be authors not to publish your book because you don't want to go on a book tour. <laughs> this is not a typical book tour, but uh, it's a very exciting way for me, uh, now having finished 25 books, I just finished the one that come out next year, it's a biography of my mother, but it gives me a chance to go out on the kind of a campaign trail and uh, promulgate my ideas about different aspects of, of world uh, affairs and also domestic affairs. So I think the first thing we do is, is maybe to have any questions you, that you might have about the film or about about the Mideast from an American perspective, and then we'll reach a high point of our evening uh, when Bishop Yunnan will uh, tell you about what's going on now uh, in Palestine, in Jerusalem, uh, and his uh, notable efforts, which we discussed this afternoon, uh, to bring together the peace-loving people who happen to be Jewish or Christian or Muslim. So... If you have any questions now about the film, the written, we'll do those first. Sir, the written questions may, uh, we might not be able to categorize them that way. So I'm going to ask anyone with questions about the film to go ahead and raise your hand. We'll improvise here a little bit. Um, if anyone had a quest couple of questions about the film, and then uh, um, if you can just speak up. If you have nice, loud voices, I think we'll catch it. Thanks. Right here? Right here? Yes, you? Are there uh, any Stand subjects you would like to see in the movie give greater emphasis? Yes, we were hoping when we heard that there was going to be a movie that it would be about the whole gamut of uh, issues in which the Carter Center is involved and not concentrate just on the one book with some, you know, 
kind of a peripheral uh, films of guinea worm and other things because Rosa and I uh, organized a Carter Center 25 years ago. We're now in 71 countries in the world, 35 in Africa. We deal with um, neglected diseases and, 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 and hold, we've hold, held, I think, now 68 elections in different parts of the world, all trouble elections and so forth. And Rosa has a nationwide, a global uh, mental health program. So we were hoping that the film would encompass a more broad-based picture of our lives and not just this particular effort. But I think that um, Jonathan Demme, who had complete control over the film, we had no control over what was shown, uh, has done a very good job in, in you know, giving this particular issue a uh, great dramatic presentation. Back here. I'm going to be Phil Donahue for a moment here. <laughs> You mentioned in the film several times that you felt like the press was biased, and I wondered um, if you could speak to um, what is the motivation or the payoff or the hidden agenda for the press and also for the Christian right in this country to not be willing to deal with the reality of what's happening. Well, I don't really blame the press. The press has to cover what is going on you know, in government and in other arenas of life. <clears throat> I don't believe you've heard a single candidate for president on the Republican or Democratic side address any of the issues that are presented in this film. If you have, I, I missed it. And you will never hear any member of Congress make any comment about Palestinian rights or about Israel withdrawing to the uh, international borders or things of that kind. So the press basically covers what is in the, you know, political debates and what's going on within the Congress and what's going on between candidates who are running for office. <clears throat> the last thing that I ever have believed, though, is that the, the press is somehow controlled uh, by any particular faction in America. Uh, this is not the case. I grew up in Georgia where the press is dominant press in Atlanta and so forth has been controlled by the Cox family. And uh, my mother, uh, my first cousin, Don Carter, was very active with uh, Knight Ritter and with the Wall Street Journal. And my wife, Rosen, was on the Gannett board that, that founded USA Today. Uh, n none of those are controlled by Jewish interests, for instance. So that's, that's certainly not to be assumed. But the press just covers what goes on uh, among the uh, debaters in America. And, and this is almost a taboo subject. I, I think that one of the, I had two subjects, two uh, proposals in mind when I wrote the book. One was to try to precipitate more effort to bring peace to Israel and its neighbors. Uh, at this moment, for seven years, there has not been one single day of substantive peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians or Syria and so forth. And uh, now there is a, a, a scheduled meeting. They don't call it a discussion or a debate or negotiation or meeting. It's going to be held before the end of this year if plan, plans go forward in Annapolis. And, and that's a very good development. I hope it will be successful. Um, and the other thing was just to precipitate a debate in our country. And I think that uh, the book has done that. But I don't blame the press. It's just that the press is covering what's happening. <clears throat> Uh, yes, sir. How could we get, um, can get a copy of this? Uh, how could we um, can get a copy of this film uh, to show the community at large? Well, Sony has bought the film rights. Uh, Jonathan Demme no longer controls the films, but my understanding is that there will be DVDs available after the film is shown in the theaters around the nation. Uh, and then the DVD will be not only the film, but, but much more extensive background information, things that couldn't be included in a two-hour film. So it will be available uh, in much more definitive uh, status uh, within a few months. I don't know exactly the schedule, but it will be available to anyone. It's showing here in Atlanta, so you could take your group to the theater maybe. My first uh, question have been answered, Good. but I just want to say on behalf of the American Palestinian community and the American Arab community, uh, you are the best of America, and I wish 
your theme of human rights around the world will continue. Uh, we salute you and thank you. I thank you for that. Uh, when I was watching the film, I was much impressed by the way that you kept your energy level up and your and health. And as an activist, I'm interested in knowing how you keep. Uh, and I know that that your praying is is very important in reading the Bible. But but uh, physically, how do you keep in physical shape to, for such a rigorous schedule as you have? Well, you may not have noticed, but I swam. Do you swim? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, all my life I've been a long-distance runner. In fact, when I was president of the United States, I ran about 40 miles a week, which is a lot of running. But I had to give up running because I had a, a, a knee that swelled up when I was 80 years old. So the last three years I haven't run. But we still ride bikes, and uh, we swim every day, and Rosa and I take long walks. And um, Rosa is an expert on nutrition, so at least when we're at home, we eat exactly the right thing with exactly the, amount, the right amount of uh, carbohydrates and everything else. And, uh, so, and we've just been lucky, you know, with, uh, so far with our health. I hope it will prevail for a few more years, but uh, we've been lucky with that. But a lot of the uh, time on film, because I couldn't act, because Jonathan Demi and his crew, sometimes with three cameras focused on my face from different directions in the same automobile, uh, was with me 16 hours a day for all those, so it wasn't any way to put on false airs, but I have to say that sometimes I was maybe tired of, than I appeared on film. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exhausting thing, but, you know, I, I start out sometime in the morning before I leave the hotel room. I'll do 24 radio interviews, 10 minutes each. Start on the East Coast say, at 6 o'clock in the morning and wind up on the West Coast uh, at 9 o'clock. And uh, never know what anybody's going to ask. And a lot of the people that ask the questions have never read my book or any other book. <laughs> 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 and, and they just, they just interfere, they interrupt their ball discussion with each other and, and their playing of uh, music to ask a question about a book they've never heard of. But uh, anyway, a lot of them, I, on the other hand, uh, know a lot about it. But, so that's, that's kind of a discipline of, uh, of promoting a book. It's a normal, well, this is not quite a normal book, to, but, but a normal book tour is still what I just described. This was more controversial, but, but uh, obviously. But exciting, more exciting. And, and I told, I've told Rosen that I, that I really enjoyed and appreciated the... Um, the, the intense debate and the controversy that was ar aroused. Mm -hmm. What I didn't like, of course, was the personal attacks. But I, as I said in the film uh, to the students at Brandeis, I can take it. You know, it doesn't bother me, really. Maybe one more question. if you're President, Car thank you for your courage on this. It seems that the, in the Mideast, n the use of nuclear weapons is a great fear that's shared by many of the nations there. Have you thought of speaking out more strongly on these issues and perhaps with former Senator Sam Nunn and former Ambassador Jim Laney right here at home? Yes, we have. <clears throat> Every five years, at least at the Carter Center, we have a definitive uh, meeting. Uh, prior to the uh, discussion of the Nonproliferation Treaty, uh, in that treaty there is a commitment from all countries led by the United States completely to eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth and constantly to reduce the level of nuclear armaments. Unfortunately, in the last six years or so, our government has uh, rejected every single nuclear arms control agreement <clears throat> ever negotiated since the time of Dwight Eisenhower. And so we uh, try to gather here about 25 or 30 nations, all of whom are technologically capable of producing nuclear weapons themselves. These are countries like Argentina or Brazil or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or obviously countries like Switzerland or Austria, about 30 of them. And they come here to prepare themselves to go to the uh, legally required 
discussion at the General Assembly of the United Nations to say how are we failing to honor the nuclear arms, uh, the non-proliferation non treaty. And, and it's a very sad commentary on current times. But um, we, we understand that threat. Uh, everybody in the Mideast knows that Israel has a very large nuclear arsenal. And uh, there's a great deal of suspicion that Iran ultimately would like to have nuclear weapons themselves. Recently, President Mubarak in Egypt last week announced that Egypt is, is uh, developing now, will develop uh, nuclear um, reactors that can produce fuel. So it, it's a great threat. The, the only way to prevent it uh, is for the United States to take the leadership role, as they did under every previous president, uh, I would say since the Second World War, un until this administration. Um, and I have, every five years I write an op-ed piece, uh, an editorial that, that is published in the New York Times or the Washington Post, and then we send it out to about 30 international newspapers. I, I wrote an op-ed piece just a few weeks ago uh, condemning the agreement between the United States and, and uh, India where the United States has agreed to sell India not only nuclear weapons material but also technology that would make it possible for them to produce nuclear weapons since India is not a signatory of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. There's just about just four countries in the world that have refused to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty. India is one of them. And I have never thought that we ought to s sell any nuclear capabilities to nations, no matter how friendly they might be, unless they were willing to comply with their restraints. So we do what we can here at the Carter Center. But, but I, I can't say that we're in the leadership. But I work very closely with Sam Nunn and with others that have joined with him uh, in that effort. Henry Kissinger is one of, one of them, and George Schultz, uh, who's former Secretary of State under President Reagan, uh, and, and I have uh, cooperated uh, in, in their effort. And now uh, it's time for us to turn to the, to the uh, headline of the evening and to the high point of the evening, and that is to listen to Bishop uh, you know, and tell us what he uh, is doing and what his status is and and the great effort that he's making to bring uh, a theological as well as a practical approach to promoting peace uh, in the Holy Land. We're glad to have you here with us. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I would like, first of all, to thank you for your prophetic role that you are playing at the moment. And I'm always saying, you see, that we need at the moment charismatic leaders that speak truth to power, not people who or politicians who only beat around the bush. <laughs> we need, I as I understand the book, you know, that you have written, I understand it in a different, in a different way than many. President Carter is telling the world, if you love the state of Israel and want, its and want its continuity in the Middle East, help Israel to end the occupation and help Israel not to become apartheid. And I think, you know, this message is not nowadays heard and anybody who sneaks his head outside a certain room, then he has all kinds of stigmatization. So, Mr. President, you are welcome to the club that we are always in it. <laughs> I would like to say this book is telling us all what I would like to say. We don't want the people to be pro-Palestinian, but we don't want them also to be pro-Israeli. We want the people in the United States of America to be pro-justice, pro-truth, pro-peace, pro-reconciliation, pro-forgiveness, pro-human rights, pro-life. 
And that's as such, we have to hear this message more and more. For me, I believe occupation is a sin against God and against humanity. Because it deprives the other their own human rights and dignity. When we call as a church, end the illegal occupation, we are saying very clearly that we want to liberate Israel and the Palestinians from the sin of occupation. Because we believe that the security of Israel is only dependent on the freedom and justice of the Palestinians. And the freedom and justice of the Palestinians are only dependent on the security of Israel. There is no other formula in the Middle East than this formula. I would like to say it seems that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is now not only the core problem of the Middle East, but it's the core problem of the whole world. If the world wants justice and peace, let it must start from Jerusalem, not from Baghdad. And I would like also to say, if the world, the Arab and Muslim world are looking to the United States of America with big eyes, for the litmus test for the Arab world, can the United States of America use one standard for justice in the Middle East? And can they bring justice and peace to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? This is really the challenge. When we as a church, many a times, working for justice, we are asked, why are you a politician? I'm always, always saying, working for justice is not only political, it's spiritual. For me, it's biblical. For I mean, when somebody, when one of my teachers in Beit Sahur comes and tell me, God is a real estate broker. God is one-sided. God does not love us Palestinians. What do I tell these people? Or she told me, one of my teachers, last night, I don't believe anymore in God. For God is only with one people against us. I told her, what do you mean, ma'am? She told me last night, my home fence was transformed to eight meters, 24 feet wall. I can no more see the landscape. I can see only the sky and my house and the ugly concrete wall. Where is God? Or another girl near Rachel's tomb. She told her mother, she is 13 years old, why did God allow us to live in a tomb? For me, we have to show the Palestinian people when working for justice that God is a God of justice and that God is an ever embracing love God. He loves also the Palestinians as he loves the Israelis and as he loves the, the Americans. That message, when we work for justice, we want to secure it for our people, the Palestinians. We are now looking with big hopes to Annapolis. They call it a meeting, they call it a consultation, whatever they call it, we don't care. We want justice. We want justice and we want them to deal now with the root cause of the problem, with the real issues. We don't want only nice smiles. We want really, as President Carter did in 1979. He dealt with the real issues. And this is the reason justice and peace could be implemented between Egypt and Syria. However, what we want, we want the issue of Jerusalem to be dealt. Jerusalem must be shared. It must be Jewish, Christian, 
Muslim, Palestinian, Israeli. Any missing of these elements, there will be no peace in the Middle East. We want a two-state solution in 1967, living side by side with each other. We want the right of return of refugees to be politically dealt with. I am a refugee. I don't want, after 20 years, that my grandchild will tell me, oh, you have been a coward, you couldn't deal our right of return. We want also the settlement policy to stop. And we want not only to share the land, we want also to share water and resources. If these are dealt in Annapolis, any president who can do it, anybody who can do it, then they deserve the real Nobel Prize from all of us, not only from Oslo. There is no other way except this way. Unfortunately, at this moment, there is a very high immigration on the side of the Palestinian Christians. Many people are saying Palestinian Christians are escaping from Palestine because they are persecuted by the Muslims. I want to tell very frankly, we Palestinian Christians are not persecuted neither by the PA nor by the, by the Muslims nor in Israel. Palestinian Christians are immigrating because of occupation. And occupation drives them to leave the country. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are, two, there are less than 2% of the total population. And if that trend continues, then we are afraid that there will be no more Christians, no more living stones in the, in the Holy Land. I tell you, the future of Christianity in the Middle East is not under occupation, nor in war, nor it is under extremism. The future of Palestinian Christianity in Palestine and Israel is only in a just peace. Our people will come back if just peace come, because at the moment there are more Palestinian Christians in Detroit and Chicago and Houston and so on than they are existing in Palestine itself. And this is shame that the Palestinian Christian church, that the Christian churches in the world are not taking that into consideration. I don't want after 15 years to come to, to ask you to come to the country and then find there some good bishops, some good monks, some good nuns, some, uh, some uh, churches and holy places, but no living human beings, living stones. Please allow Palestinian Christians to stay in the country. I am really happy to tell you that there are many Mos Muslim and Jewish colonists in the world that are writing what is an Arab and Muslim world without Arab-Palestinian Christianity. And they, they even wrote there to write these things, that they guarantee us for the Arab Christianity and Palestinian Christianity are the guarantees for democracy and building a civil society in the whole Arab world. Please do your utmost to help us in a just peace to stay in the country. We can only stay when there is just peace. It doesn't mean we are weaker, but I can understand the needs of many Palestinian Christians who need passes to come to, to a place, or I cannot gather my synod or my, my church elders or our congregation members to have meetings in Bethlehem or in Jerusalem or in Nazareth. Or, or in Nazareth. I have to take them to Jordan because this is easier to pass there and it's more expensive. Where is the world? We Christians want to live in dignity, as every Palestinian Muslim and as everybody wants to live. Many are telling that at the moment extremism is growing. 
And usually I am saying, yes, extremism is growing. And we have to be careful and be fair in our judgment. When we speak nowadays on extremism, we always pinpoint on Islamic extremism. But we forget Christian extremism. And we forget Jewish extremism. And they are all as good as each other. <laughs> because I want to tell you, we have Christians to clean our dirty kitchen before we ask other religions to clean their dirty lounges. And the Christian kitchen is very dirty. The Christian right are not rendering any service, neither to the Jews, nor to the, nor to the Christians, nor to the Muslims, nor to the Palestinians, nor to the Israelis, nor to the Americans. They are driving the American society into a culture of militarization. And they are driving the whole Middle East into a culture of injustice and confrontation. Please, any scenarios that come from eschatological, biblical understanding, they are scenarios that are not realistic and they are far from our scripture and far what, from what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has taught us. These scenarios and all the scenarios of war, scenarios of Armageddon, scenarios of making my Christ being a Christ of the sword and being Christ of, the, of, uh, of killing and violence. My Christ is always the Christ of the cross and never the Christ of war. And this is the reason, this is the only Christ that I can offer to my world. This is the, 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 the Christ of the cross. For this reason, this extremism, what they are offering to us, it's very dangerous. And we have together with the American people to stop that kind of false teaching or even sick ideology. The Islamic also the, uh, extremism is also dangerous, which also promotes violence and which also promotes that the whole world must have, must be Islamic, Islamist, and there must have on one caliphate. This is not acceptable, and they can use any means in order to dehumanize and demonize others. We have clearly to speak against any kind of, of Islamic extremism that promotes violence or terrorism or anything, because our role as Christian church and as people of faith is only to speak for life. Jewish Extremism is also dangerous that call for a transfer of Palestinians from their country into some other countries. As, as, as one has said, we want to transfer them to Bulgaria. I don't want to leave Jerusalem. I have been a refugee. I'm a refugee from Beersheba. And I am proud to be a refugee, even if I am oppressed. But I, I, nobody will drive me out of Jerusalem this Jerusalem is not my Jerusalem. This Jerusalem is our Jerusalem. And we have to, to take good care of our Jerusalem. We want our Jerusalem. We want our, our Jerusalem to be a Jerusalem that is inclusive for everybody. As I have told Condoleezza Rice three weeks ago when we met her in Jerusalem, that extremism cannot be combated by shelling or bombing. Extremism can be combated only by education and by prophetic interfaith dialogue. And I want to tell you that education, as I have spoken with the chief rabbis of Israel and with the Islamic leadership, only education that promotes hate-free texts is the only education we want to give in Palestine and to Israel to our children. We have to clean our curricula in Palestine and Israel from any hatred towards the other. Because nobody is pure and clean. And that is very important 
for promoting a new generation that, li- that knows how to live with the other religion and that knows how to live in justice and peace with the other and respect the other. Interfaith dialogue is very important. And I want to tell you, we have established for the first time in history the Council for Religious Leadership in, in the Holy Land. This is the, for the, it, it consists of the two chief rabbis. It consists of the Islamic leadership and, and the heads of the local churches. I want to tell you, this council wants to deal with issues that are very dear to, to all of us. This council is a hope for us to be prophetic at this time when we notice that religion has become part of problem. We want to tell the world that religion is part of the solution. You have the paper in front of you, the communique, if you want to read it. But I want to end with this remark. What we want you to help us, help us to bring justice and peace to the Middle East. We don't want the American administration to leave its traditional ally Israel. But we want the United States of America to have another traditional ally with who, who are the Palestinians. Two allies are better than one. <laughs> and I want to end. I am only dreaming for a day, and I hope it's today, that, my, that we Palestinians can see God in the Israelis. And that the Israelis can see God in us, the Palestinians. And that we can accept each other humanities. And that we can mutually recognize each other, human, civil, religious, political, and national rights. Only then, the Holy Land will become a land of milk and honey for both Palestinians and Israelis. May God bless you. We have a, a, a few minutes for questions. Bishop Yunan, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, sure, you can join us on the, on the stage for questions. President Carter, there's a couple for you if you wanted to answer any. Um, the first question um, to President Carter is, have you had the chance, since uh, the bishop raised the issue of the, the Christian right, have you had the chance to discuss the book, Palestine Peace, Not Apartheid, with any of members of the Christian Zionist community. In general, have you found ways to have a constructive dialogue with this group about the Middle East? The last uh, day, two days of January, the first day of February, we're going to have a meeting in Atlanta of, uh, of what I would call the, the moderate Baptists. But these are Baptists who uh, don't predicate our faith on animosity or hatred, but on love and companionship and who worship the Prince of Peace, not the Prince of War. And But uh, as far as dealing specifically with the Christian right and debating them, no, I haven't been involved in that. Yeah. Thank you. To the bishop, do you think that trying to change the Hamas government control of the Gaza Strip is a first step in promoting peace in the region? Mm-hmm. If not, what would be the first step? Well, I would like first of all to say that when we look at the issue of Hamas, we have not to deal with it, to pick it up from the box and choose it and forget forget the whole context. Hamas did not come to power out of the moon. (laughs) They came to power because of the frustration of the people. Yes, there was corruption on the side of Fatah. We know we don't we don't deny it, but they came because the people are frustrated. And as long as there is frustration, these extremists will win ground. The first step is to bring justice. Once 
you bring justice once the occupation ends, once the Palestinians have their their, their state on 67 boards alongside the state of Israel, living in peace and justice. I promise you, Hamas will no more win. Only the moderates then will win. And this is the reason the first step is end the illegal occupation. Thank you. Why do so many of the players in the Middle East say that for there to be peace, the American government has to take the lead? Is it because there is so much money in play and interests? Can you answer that? For me? Yes. Well, I think, you know, history has taught us that the peace that was between Egypt and uh, Israel was only led by the United States of America, by President Jimmy Carter. The superpower at the moment who can bring peace to the Middle East is only the United States of America. And for this reason, I believe that the United States of America has to be an honest broker at the moment. If the United States of America looks at its, in, at its, its, its interest in the Middle East, I think its interests are both with Israel and with the Arab and Muslim world. And for this reason, they can do it and implement it as a super world. We know very well that Europe cannot do it without the United States of America. We have to speak on real politics. However, I would like to say that it's better now that the United States leads and leads charismatically and prophetically both Palestinians and Israelis who are incapable together to do it without the United States of America. Otherwise, if the United States doesn't lead, I'm afraid somebody else will lead that nobody likes it. That's right. Bishop Yunan, is there any hope of removing the Israeli settlements from the West Bank? Well, I think, you know, the Israeli settlement, first of all, the policy. There must be a policy to end settlements from the West Bank. And, and because I want to say very clearly, the settlements are built on confiscated Palestinian land. They are not built in Israel proper. If they are built in Israel proper, they are welcome to, to, to be there. Now, there are two options, or three options, or whatever options the political negotiations uh, should really take place. One of them, either to leave them and to withdraw from them, and at the same time to allow the Palestinian refugees from Lebanon, for example, to live in them. They are 450,000. Why not? Or if any Israeli, if any Jew wants to stay on the settlements, they are welcome, but with a Palestinian passport and under the Palestinian constitution. Hmm. <laughs> How can we peace-loving Americans connect with those worldwide who may not, realize, may not realize that many of us are in solidarity as citizens of this fragile planet? Well, I think, you know, uh, this is a challenge which I have always when I visit the Arab world. What are the Americans doing? The Americans, they want to do one, two, three, and always they look at the Americans from the side of their, you know, uh, of their administration and their policies. We are trying as churches to, to tell them the other side of the, co the coin, that the American people many a time are not aware of the injustice that is going in the Middle East. And we need only such leaders like President Carter to tell the world, wait a minute, Please understand things differently. However, we must also be allies with many churches in the Middle East and allow our people in the Middle East to know that there are many churches in the United States of America that, ha that dare to sneak their head and work with justice and be in solidarity with people who are suffering and with the oppressed, which the Arab and Muslim world do not know about them. 
And it's our duty as Palestinian Christians to be the voice of the Arab and Muslim world to the United States of America and your voice to the Muslim and Arab world in order that they understand what many good willing Americans are doing for justice and peace for us. This is the reason we are seeking now at the moment for allies from the Jewish people, from the Islamic nations, from the Americans, from the Europeans, from the Palestinians that can make, that, that can be allies and our voices for justice and peace may become a symphony for justice and peace and reconciliation that can change the Middle East. One more question. I hate to, that was a great ending, but there was one more question that I wanted to give you. I hope this symphony will be today. Yes. <laughs> the one last question, because as we're going into the Annapolis meeting, yes. um, I think maybe you can give our audience something to think about as they're observing that uh, process unfold. Yasser Arafat was blamed for the failure of the, first, of the second Camp David in year 2000. Um, how would, you, how would you ask us to look at the events as they unfold to ensure that one side is not blamed if the peace talks fail? Well, the easy game is to blame the other. And we in the Middle East are tired of blaming the other and stigmatizing the other and demonizing the other and labeling the other. This kind of stigmatization is always there because... We, we, the Palestinians, are always on the weaker side. And when you are on the weaker side, you see, you don't have parents to go there and cry and weep. And this is the reason, we, and this is the reason we feel like orphans. And for this reason, we are afraid. And I've spoken with Abu Mazen, and I told him, you, you must do something, you know, and in order that these major issues that are the basics for Palestinians will be addressed in Annapolis. You know, and I want to again mention something, that if Annapolis fails, then we moderates will become a minority in the Middle East. Because Annapolis, the, it, it, the, in Annapolis, the whole Muslim and Arab world are saying, let us see if Abu Mazen is serious, if, if Olmert is serious, if President Bush is serious, if they find that Annapolis has been like other meetings, then I'm again afraid that extremism will take over. For me, we must really now encourage our leadership to go to Annapolis, but also not to go out of Annapolis except with tangible result that will give justice for Palestinians and Israelis equally. That is my dream at the moment. But at the same time, to have in mind land for peace, not only the West Bank and Gaza, but also the Golan Heights and Shaba in Lebanon, all Arab land that is under occupation, that Annapolis will say it will be returned to the Arabs and two-state solution and the Arab initiative will be really discussed and will be implemented. Only then there will be hope in a hopeless situation. Thank you very much, Bishop. I would like to thank you all for coming out tonight. As you're leaving, if you're interested in having more information about the Carter Center programs in the West Bank, there is an email list for you to sign your email. We can update you on the Carter Center's activities in the West Bank. Thank you very much for coming.